Thank you for tuning in to TalkWad.com, the world's fastest-growing internet radio network. Please check out all the other great shows on www.talkwad.com. Welcome to Think Up Unlimited Possibilities. This show is designed to uplift you as well as explore the cohesive nature of the universe in order to discover the unlimited possibilities available through converging and expanding consciousness. And here's your host, Patricia V. Scott. Hello, and thank you to Think Up Unlimited Possibilities. That's what the up stands for. If you've been following this show, I believe this is show number five. And uh, I talked a little bit in the first show about how I came up with that up name and symbol. And, uh, of course, you can go into the archives and listen to all of the past shows. And originally, I wanted to start a theme for this show that was going to be, that is going to be, and is about getting a mindset for being up as up as possible because up is obviously always better than down. And if you think up, if you look up, if you feel up, everything about that is, is uplifting and, and can help you to be more powerful, more in tune with all of the possibilities of the world, life, and the universe. And we'll be exploring so many things as the weeks go on with this show. And I'm, I'm just, my mind is going in so many directions here. Last week, I started... Uh, talking about uh, the topic for last week was based on uh, some research I did on the book Getting Well Again, which was written by uh, the Simon. It was based on the Simonton studies, as they're known. Back in the 70s, they researched uh, cancer patients and had some phenomenal results with working with imagery, visualization, what in my world we would call hypnosis. Uh, positive imagery, attitude adjustment, that kind of thing. And I'm going to continue with that because it turned out that there's so much here that uh, we're, we're going to keep going with it. Now, some of these shows, uh, I do want to mention that you can call in live uh, to this show if you're listening live, 7.30 to 8.30 Thursdays. Right now, you could call in at 727-493-2055. And from time to time, if I get a call, I'd be more than happy to segue into whatever is uh, or seems to be relevant to the topics, and uh, that can go in, in many directions, I'm sure. So feel free to do that. And again, this is Think Up. I am Patricia Scott, Patricia V. Scott. And as I mentioned, I will probably never say what the V stands for, but it stands for victorious as far as I'm concerned. So always better to be a victor than a victim, and we'll do a whole show on that at some point. So I'm going to review just a little bit here because I want to uh, give you a flavor for for what these studies were about, and I I found it really nice and interesting to see that uh, the Getting Well Again book, the secondary title on it was uh, the Simonton's Self Awareness Techniques, Self Awareness, and that's the way I think about all of these things that I talk about on this show that I will be talking about hypnosis, NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, and all of the other types of modalities and things that are more from the modern century, from the new century. And, and, of course, none of these things are really new. They're new labels. Perhaps they've been repackaged many, many times with different names and titles and labels. But, and as you probably already know if you've listened to any of these or if you know me, labels aren't important. It's, it's what we've decided to use in our communication to call something, it's, it's really irrelevant as far as what is true, what is real, and how something works. When I'm working with issues with clients, uh, such as cancer or any kind of a physical uh, condition, I always tell them the, the mind doesn't need that label. You know, before that disease was, was coined or it was discovered and someone put a name on it, those kinds of things possibly were still happening within the body without needing the name. The, the mind knows what's going on in the body. And the same thing with cures or pills or techniques or any of that. It's not the name that is important. It's how the mind and the body and the belief system and the expectations all come together and understand what's happening at a higher level of mind, what I like to call that, that unlimited mind. 
So I'm going to just review just a tiny bit about uh, what I covered with this last week. And basically, just a real quick overview that the Simonton's, what they uh, bottom line discovered from all of their studies of cancer patients was that uh, they seem to have, generally, they seem to have problems uh, in their lives that were aggravated uh, or compounded by a series of stresses within approximately 18 months prior to the onset of the disease, of the illness. And uh, we talked a bit about their, their model, their mind-body model of cancer development. And we talked about from the psychological stress uh, leading to despair or depression, affecting the limbic system, the hypothalamus, going to the p- pituitary activity, affecting the endocrine system, and uh, on and on, going, uh, obviously, uh, increasing then the cancerous cell growth, um, affecting the immune system negatively, and uh, suppressing that immune activity. So uh, that's the general progression model that they used for this book. And then getting into uh, some of the more details of that, we did that last week, so I won't go back on that. I do want to just go back into uh, something that I that struck me last week as being really important because the, one of the main things they found was that uh, people that had better outcomes with diseases, conditions, and, and again, this book mostly deals with cancer, and yet all of the things that we're talking about, you could apply to so many other things. Uh, I always say everything affects everything, and pretty much uh, one thing that we talk about can be applied, or, or the, at least the elements and principles of it can definitely be applied to any other problem or condition or disease or whatever that's going on in someone's life. Any challenge, basically, can be, can be looked at from some of these same principles being true. And what they found was uh, that people that participated in their health, uh, that was kind of the first step um, to determine, you know, what kinds of behaviors contributed to their uh, vulnerability to disease and, and getting them involved with the healing process because they were most definitely involved with the illness process. And not to put any blame on anything, it's just that whatever is happening within the physical body and the mind and the emotions are all based on whatever has the input, how it's being processed up to that point in time, whether it's elements from the uh, environment or whether it's negative influences from when someone was a child or, or, or from some other peers uh, that, that developed some kind of behaviors or thought patterns throughout their life. It's not about blame. It's about whatever's happening right now is based on how these things are being processed. So uh, the thing I love about what I do is that when someone walks in, it's not about fixing anything. And I truly do feel that way. I felt that way before I was even drawn into this field. And I think that's why I like hypnosis and NLP so much, because you take all of that off of it. It's not about blame or it's not about anything like that. It's about what is happening right now. How can we look at it without all of the opinions, all of the judgments, all of the it's good, bad, horrible, terrible Take all that off of it and just look purely at what is happening right now and what is that person's uh, part in what's happening right now and how can we adjust the elements that that person has control over in order to give them some sense of, of control over what's happening. And what I have found through the years, and, and like I said, even before I got into this as a profession, is that we have a whole lot more control over what's happening with us than most people realize. And that's what's fun to me about what I do, is, is discovering even more control. Um, I fixed my eyesight many years ago uh, with hypnosis and with the power of the mind, or whatever word you want to call it. Like I said, I'm not stuck on that word, other than that's what my certification, most of, most of my certifications are in. And yet, uh, Whatever it is, it's about the science of how the mind works and how it interacts with the body and how it can produce results and changes at the cellular level, at the muscular level, at the immune system level, whatever's needed in order to achieve some positive goal. And I was speaking with someone earlier today, and they were asking if uh, hypnosis could be be, uh, used if it was helpful for tinnitus. I said, it's helpful for anything if it's possible. If the mind is involved, and it usually is involved with everything much more than we realize, then 
by applying mental faculties and focus and positive intention and creating a positive expectation and a belief system that supports uh, the possibility that something good can happen, which is how I started when I, when I created the project of working with my eyes, then if it's possible, it usually will far exceed what you have consciously allowed yourself or thought was possible. So, uh, again, I have worked with tinnitus and things like that, and it, it does respond. Sometimes the body can completely uh, get past that. Now, I don't, I don't know what it does. <laughs> That's the challenge of what I do. It's like, how does the mind work? And I think I said in one of the shows, you know, if they dissect your body after you die, they can't find your mind. They can find your brain and your body, your physical body that the, that the mind used, but they, they don't know where the mind is. And they can detect signals uh, outside of your physical body in the, in the energy field, even an inch or two past your body, they can detect a pain signal before the brain even registers the, the feeling of pain. So where do we really end? Where does that mind really end? I just find all this so fascinating. And that's kind of some of the things we're going to be exploring throughout uh, the time that I'm doing this show, which hopefully will be a very long time. So participating in health. And then this, this struck me, this one part here, it says, the object of the initial step of participating in your health, in other words, is to help the patient find more effective ways of coping with these stresses and to free up the energy they will need in fighting their disease. Free up the energy, because if you're spending all of your energy worrying and feeling bad and, and focusing on those negatives, and, and when someone has an illness, that's usually, uh, they're hearing all of the worst case scenarios from the medical profession because that's what they have to do. They have to prepare people and let them know what the stats are and all of that. And yet for that person, some of those things may or may not be accurate. And there's a part of them that I, again, call the higher mind or the unconscious mind that does know exactly what's going on. And there's, you know, there's so many recorded scenarios of people being misdiagnosed and, you know, dying when the doctor said they were going to die and then they find out they didn't even have, that they were misdiagnosed. They didn't even have that condition or disease and they should have lived much longer. But, but the mind getting involved can send it in one direction or the other. So it is about freeing up that energy. As soon as, uh, the phrase that I use a lot is we move in the direction of our most dominant thought. Whatever you're thinking of most of the time and how you're thinking about it is the direction that your mind, your unconscious mind is going to go, it's going to take off in that direction and keep going until you switch your mind to some other direction. And thank goodness we have 100% control over what we choose to entertain in thought. And I think a lot of people don't even realize that. I don't think some people even are aware, even throughout their whole life, and, and how sad I find that to be, because we do have control of our thoughts, and our thoughts can shift our experience that we're having in a more positive direction and, and allow things, even when things are very challenging, to be much more, uh, much more easy to get through or, or more pleasant or at least to get through it and not have those negative effects on the physical body. So I was on a show earlier this week called The Caregiver Hour. It's on uh, Monday mornings. And it's on 1250 AM. Kim Linder has it. It's a beautiful show. She's been doing this show, I think, for a couple of years. I've been on it a couple of times, about three times, I think. And she, uh, she, it's all about caregivers. And caregivers are, you know, most people at some point in their life are caregivers for others. Um, even if you just had children or if you have elderly parents or a lot of people, of course, work in the field of caregiving. And yet uh, caregivers are notorious for being very stressed out, for always giving, 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 emptying out, emptying out. And then they aren't filling themselves up with positives. So they tend to start taking on some of the negative aspects of the people they're caring for. And I work with caregivers quite often. And in our trainings, uh, I'm a certified master trainer, I mentioned, um, of hypnosis. And a lot of caregivers, nurses, uh, counselors, people like that come to our training because they do realize they have to stay in a, in a healthy state, as healthy a state as possible, a strong state, a focused state, in order to deal with the challenges that they have 
working with other people who are having, uh, you know, a lot of problems. So it's about being strong so that you so that you have that strength to be able to help other people. And people in the helping profession, again, they tend to take on a lot and forget to take care of themselves. So that's that's what we talked about on that show. And it is a wonderful resource for people who are find themselves caregivers, especially if they ha- aren't prepared for it and they just find that all of a sudden they are a caregiver and need some help. A lot of resources on that on that show and that website, uh, caregiver, uh, caregiverhour.com, I believe is the website. Anyway, um, so freeing up the energy, sending the energy in a positive direction. When we talk about thinking up, to bring it back to the title of this show. I, when I came up with that years ago, I, I noticed through the years again before I even knew I was going to be doing the work that I do now. And I was in show business for many years. That'll come up from time to time in the show. And what I found was if I wasn't feeling up energetically, mentally, physically, if I was down in any of those areas that, you know, you can't perform that way. And the other thing I found was that as soon as I shifted my focus on a performance, whatever it happened to be at that point in my career, that by getting involved with a performance, whether it was singing or acting or songwriting or performing in a studio or on TV or whatever, film, uh, a performance by getting your mind, your focus, your attention wrapped up in that task and getting getting involved with it, it by just by doing that brought you up, brought you up into a more positive state, a more focused state, a more efficient state, a healthier state. And for the whole 20 years that I was in that business, I don't remember even taking an aspirin. I, I just never got sick. And I even had a mantra. I'd say, I, I don't get sick. People around me would all get sick and they'd tell me, you know, don't let me breathe on you because... I'm sick. And I'd say, don't worry, I'm immune. I don't get sick. And somehow, uh, maybe it was naivete, (laughs) but uh, I never got sick. So, you know, what's with that? And then as I started studying hypnosis uh, through the years, I did realize that the mind is very, very powerful and can get past so many limiting thoughts, so many uh, expectations perhaps that others have. Like, you know, if I breathe on you, I'll make you sick. Well, no, I have some control over that uh, transaction. And I tell people when I teach in in my classroom, I have the remote control for the television and I hold it up and I say, as long as I keep my own remote control and don't hand it to you and give you permission to push my buttons, then you can't push my buttons. I'm pushing my own buttons. And, And there's all kinds of little techniques that I teach my clients and teach in classes about how to Keep your remote control. Uh, you're in charge of your power center that is that is inside of you, your mind being the most powerful part of that. And that you, unless someone ha- unless you give someone permission, no one on the outside can affect your state if you don't allow them to. So uh, we can do a whole show on that probably at some point. Okay. So I wanted to read that one sentence there. Um, learning to relax and visualize. That was a big part of their studies that they did. They talked about that. Now, um, once a month, uh, I teach a continuing education class for hypnotists. I call it a master class because it's for people uh, to get, again, that have already been certified in hypnosis, either with me or with some other credible uh, organization, and they can come for practice because the only way you get good at anything is by practicing, right? And I mean, I'm constantly going to conferences and classes and, and learning new things and relearning old things and just constantly evolving my my profession, hopefully, and my skill by doing that. And uh, later this month on February 27th, I'm, we're doing one just on confidence. It's a different topic every month. And we invite then the public gets to come and be practice clients. So it's a lot of fun. And you get to usually be hypnotized two or three times throughout the course of the evening by different professional hypnotists certified hypnotists. And, and it's so much fun. And people, without exception, if they've never had an experience of hypnosis, uh, I don't remember anyone ever leaving without being uh, pretty amazed and having some aha moments. Uh, for some people, it's just realizing that they can relax that much. For others, it's, it's, they get some, some insights or some profound shift or movement in some direction that they had been looking for, perhaps for a very long time. 
So um, another part of the uh, getting well again methods that they used with these cancer patients was creating, they call it creating the future, setting goals. And that might sound very simplistic, and it is. But And yet, how many people actually do set goals, very efficient goals? And again, it's a matter of how you frame your goal, because some people come to me and I say, what, what is your goal for doing hypnosis? And they say, I want to stop smoking. They'll, they'll make some comment like that, for instance. And for the unconscious part of your mind, that doesn't give it anything to do. There's nothing that your mind, that activates your mind to do something when you say stop or don't or won't or can't. Uh, those are should. <laughs> those kinds of statements as goals, they're not action statements. The unconscious is waiting for you to tell it what you want it to do. So if someone says, I want to quit smoking, I say, well, that's what you don't want to do, and that's what you keep doing, not surprisingly, since that's where your focus is. What do you want to do instead of that? And just setting goals can be a whole, a whole session in itself. And in my hypnosis trainings that I do, we, we spend a lot of time on creating goals. How do you formulate your goal to make it something your unconscious actually understands what you're asking for? Because if you say stop smoking, your focus is on smoking. If you say, I want to be healthy and breathe healthy air, now your mind says, oh, you want to breathe healthy air. Now, that smoke going in there is against that goal. So it's now, it's, now it knows some things that it needs to change in order to accomplish the goal you've given it to act on. So it really is really important how you frame your goals to yourself. And especially with diseases, conditions, well, maybe not especially, but in, in any instance, but it may be more critical, so to speak, when you're working with something like cancer and these things. So creating a future, setting goals in, in an efficient, positive way is a very important element of it. And then they even have a chapter in Getting Well Again on uh, Finding your inner guide to health. <laughs> and I found that nice because uh, in the work that we do in, in visualization and guided imagery when we're using hypnosis and NLP, uh, there are a lot of nice techniques about finding your inner guide. I do a class uh, sometimes for the master class called uh, con Connecting with Your Inner Genius. And it's pretty amazing once you get into that creative imagination what your mind will come up with to help you with those kinds of things. Um, again, if anybody wants to call in and, and add to or has a question about any of this, uh, here at talkwad.com, that's what we're, where we're broadcasting here, and this is Think Up Unlimited Possibilities, you can call in at 727-493-2055, and I will be more than happy to hear from you. Uh, if any time you're listening to this when it isn't live, you can contact me through my website, uphypnosis.com. Up, of course right over my head here. <laughs> it's always right over my head, right where I want it. So uh, think up. So uphypnosis.com is, is the website, and you can email me at info at uphypnosis.com. And I'll be more than happy anytime to, uh, to get back with you and, and help you on, on your journey, on your search in this wonderful world of the unlimited mind. And of course, uh, in any kind of illness, exercise, some kind of physical activity is always... Uh, most always something that, that assists in the healing process. You can't be stagnant. The, we are not created to be stagnant. Um, so, and, and by the way, we're never just standing still. And, and I think of these techniques of, of getting you unstuck. And if you think you're just standing still, you really aren't because you, you are either moving forward or you're moving in the other direction. So you definitely don't want to do that. Um, another part of, of dealing with uh, cancer that they found was a big element was uh, dealing with the fear, uh, the fear of recurrence, the fear of death, all of these kinds of fears. Again, negative emotions that are created based on what the person is thinking about, how they're thinking about their life, their condition, the possibilities of the future will create fear. And the unconscious can just as efficiently and easily create a positive expectation, strengthening emotions. A, p a positive emotion strengthens your organism, strengthens your body, increases your immune system. So you can catch those things and find some pattern interrupts 
that we can that we can develop and start to interrupt those negative thought patterns and start to create some more positive directions to send your thoughts. And it's very easy to do. Like I said, it's just as easy for your mind to create a stress response as it is to create a relaxation response. So as soon as you realize you have 100% control over those thoughts that you choose to entertain, then you can, you can start interrupting the negative ones as soon as you start to not feel as good as you want to feel. You know it's based on something you're thinking that is sending your mind in a negative direction, and you can interrupt it. I use taking a deep breath and pressing my fingers and thumbs together like the yoga thing. And just because it's, it reminds me I'm pushing my own buttons, it reminds me that I am in control in that moment, in the now, brings me back to the moment where I have a choice. And I can say, I don't feel as good as I want to feel. What am I thinking? How am I thinking about this thing or this event or this person? And as soon as I become aware and get back into now, back in control, in my control center <laughs> here, now I can choose something else. What can I th- how can I think about this in a way that I feel better, that I'm stronger, that, I, that I'm more empowered? So that's what that's about. And fear, any, any, again, any negative emotion, fear is, is very, very destructive to the cells. It's destructive to the body, and it suppresses the immune system. So you really want to get those kind of things, regrets. Uh, bitterness, anger, if you have any emotions about anything from your past or about the situation you're in now that is, that is in that direction, that it has to do with anger, fear, uh, bitterness, regret, those kinds of things, they are figments of the imagination, and they truly are in your control to change. You can change those quite quickly and easily. The thing that takes the long sometimes is, is believing that you can do it. As soon as you realize you can do it now, then it becomes like, oh, I can do this. Instead of, oh, I wonder how or how can I do this or I don't know if I can do this, all that kind of thing. And as soon as you clear all that clutter away, and the, one of the best ways I've found in my life to do that is through these hypnotic processes to quiet the mind, to get all of that clutter out of the way. And in the clarity of that moment, the answers are just so obvious. They're so clear. They're so matter of fact. And you find ways to send your thoughts in a direction that, that just naturally, easily, and obviously becomes apparent that will bring you up out of that, whatever it was. Instantly strengthening your immune system. Instantly strengthening and, and aiding the healing process if you do have something going on in your body. So why would you not want to learn these techniques? I, I it's, it's so easy and it's so effortless once you learn it and it feels so good. And it has a ripple effect. I always tell people there's a ripple effect that it starts to enhance every area of your life. That's one of the most fun things about what I do is people, whatever we're working on, uh, the specific goal in hypnosis and NLP and all these techniques, that they'll always come back and tell me all of the other things that are changing, relationships, sleeping better. Uh, financial success, things in areas that they would have never logically or consciously thought had anything to do with what we were doing. So when you start to get into that power center of your mind and start thinking in ways that empower you, that are more positive, that connect you with, uh, that open that channel to the creative unconscious, to that, to the higher faculties, it also opens up that channel. I was talking to someone uh, earlier today about the channel opens up depending on your words for it, to that other realm, that abstract realm that is really where, I'll, where the power comes from. Whatever, however your thoughts are about that, it does happen. And again, I don't care what your labels are for any of that. I see it, I feel it, I experience it, and I watch other people access it. And all of a sudden, they're, they're getting more. They're getting more assistance from where, however you think about those things. So the inner guide to health is, is a metaphor. A lot of the best ways to reach the creative unconscious and to get it activated in ways uh, to help you with conditions and problems in your life is through metaphor, through creative imaging, because it really does get your more logical mind out of the way more, and, and that's a lot of fun too. Uh, so I want to get to another part of this that, we're about where we left off last time. 
uh, though uh, chronic illness may close some doors, many people choose to use it as an opportunity to open new ones. You may be one of those people. You may know people that have done this where they had a physical challenge, perhaps even a very, very major physical illness or challenge in their life. And they actually used that, that strong emotion connected with that to catapult them into an even higher appreciation, a higher involvement with life, and ended up using it, like I said, as a catapult that they ended up creating enormously amazing and positive things in their life from that. And that's a choice. That's a choice. Because you can have two people with the same challenges, and they can go in two completely opposite directions based on how they choose to think about it. I remember seeing a gentleman on a, a, t- a morning show one time. I just happened to catch, catch a glimpse of it as I was uh, getting ready in the morning. The TV was on. And it was a, a young man who was born with no arms and no legs. And this whole show was about him and all of the different things he had done with his life. He was doing mountain climbing. He was doing, uh, he was a wrestler um, with, with people with arms and legs, by the way, not with other people with, with limitations. And he never thought of himself as, as limited in any way. He, he had done more. I think when I saw him, he, was, he looked to be maybe his early 20s or something. And he had already done more in his life than most people I've ever met do in their entire lifetime. So he used that. He was born that way, and his mother, he said, uh, addressed him just as if this is just the way it is. There was no no kind of victim-type mindset about it at all. And if he needed, uh, if he went and asked her for help with something, she would just say, well, go go do it and see if you can do it yourself. If you need help, I'll I'll be here. So he learned how to be very self-sufficient and and he, he had the most wonderful mental attitude about it. And he wrote a book. I remember his name was Sean something. I can't remember his last name, but uh, it really struck me. I just saw him that one time, never saw him or heard of him after that. But he had written a book called No Excuses. I do remember the name of that book because that, was, that encapsulated the way he thought about his life himself. Now, that same situation, being born with no arms and no legs, first of all, uh, the mother had the choice and was told about the, the malformation uh, before he was born. She had a choice. She could have uh, chosen not to have him, and probably no one would have blamed her for that. And she could have had all kinds of justifications for that, I'm sure. And yet, as he was growing up, if you, get, if, if you have someone else that was born that way with no arms and legs, they could start to choose or be encouraged and and dealt with in ways that caused them to start to think of themselves as a victim as a child and grow up with a whole different experience of life with, with very little quality of life. So, you know, it's, it really is a choice. And this young man just seemed very happy. And like I said, he was doing so many things. It was, it was truly incredible. So no excuses, right? Just look at what, what is happening and what can you do with it? What can you do with it? Not what can't I do or what, what's limiting me. So uh, first and foremost, um, when I work with any kind of physical type of situation, I always start with a, with a relaxation because, again, that, that relaxation response, when somebody's stressed out about their condition or about a problem in their life, again, you can apply it to anything. The first and foremost thing that's happening is stress about this thing. And it's occupying a lot of their mind usually, too. It's occupying way too much of their mental thoughts in negative ways. So the progressive relaxations, the, the full body relaxations that I do with these people, sometimes, many times is the first time in a long time, if not ever, that they ever allowed themselves or realized that they could relax to that point on purpose. And it's an amazing uh, realization and awareness that, that the person has that their body and mind together can and, and does relax very easily, very effortlessly, because the body and mind want to do that. It's a natural thing. The body needs that rest and relaxation. And through those processes also, it quiets the mind. And that's a nice starting point to begin to plant new seeds, so to speak, to start to bring around fresh ways of thinking of things. And first, you got to kind of clear. you got to empty it out. I always say if the glass is already filled with, with mud and muck, and you start 
trying to pour pure water in there, that's kind of not very efficient way of doing it. You've got to start to wait for all that mud and muck to kind of flow over the edges. And little by little, it'll take forever and probably won't ever be clear. But if you empty out some of that first and leave some space in there, now you've got room to put something. So if, if the vessel is already full of negative thought, if your mind vessel is full of negativity, you got to clear some space. And that's what these techniques are, are wonderful for. Uh, they clear up the mind. They free it up to be able to start filling and accessing ways of thinking that are, that are more productive, that are, that are more action-oriented, that get the person unstuck. So I, I almost always do uh, some kind of a physical relaxation with people when I'm working with them. And the, the Simontons in this book that we're talking about today, and this will probably go for another couple of, of, of shows, is on their studies from the 1970s, uh, the Simontons' uh, famous studies on cancer. The book is called Getting Well Again. And uh, they found the attitudes and emotions that were involved, uh, the images uh, that come to the person when they're in a relaxed state are used to create positive suggestions, positive imagery, and to reframe any limiting thoughts or beliefs they may be harboring. So someone in a situation uh, with, with cancer or with a, a disease or condition like this starts to build up a belief system. And if some of those beliefs aren't in line with what is possible in, in a positive direction for them, uh, you got to clear some of those. you got to shake them up. I call it shaking up the belief systems. And sometimes all it takes is having a little tiny pinhole of possibility that is considered that, that, that it might be possible, that something may be possible. And that usually, I've found, is enough for the unconscious to say, good, now I've got permission to show you something. And then the mind steps in and doing what it does best, which is move in the positive direction of, of your best health and well-being. And before you know it, things are miraculously changing. So um, some of the uh, benefits of relaxation and mental imagery that, they, that the Simontons found uh, were a reduction, again, a reduction of fear and a, and a feeling out of control. So the person starts to get a sense of being having some control over their situation. Uh, they found that an improved attitude and an increase in the will to live in these people, this is all from relaxation and positive mental imagery. Enhanced immune response, we talked about that already, uh, uh, that resulted from positive changes in thought patterns. Um, evaluation and alteration of current beliefs that may hinder healing, like I just talked about. They found an improved communication with the unconscious that they are more in touch with themselves, with their self. So there's a lot of self-awareness. And believe me, and I'm sure a lot of you know, the design is miraculous. The design is, is perfection. So once you get in touch with that self and, and the original design, truly remarkable things do begin to happen. Um, improved uh, bodily functions, obviously, a decrease in stress and tension a greater sense of optimism and confidence in the body's ability to heal. So there you go. Pretty cool. Now, um, using hypnosis along with relaxation and mental imagery, uh, the, the adding the hypnotic uh, element to, to that, and actually guided imagery can be a, a form of hypnosis, and yet uh, using some of the hypnotic techniques, the NLP techniques along with these things, um, actually enhances, accelerates healing, and that's been proven in many studies. Uh, so to add those things, usually, again, I do relaxation, then some deepening techniques, and then creating uh, imagery and, and metaphors and things like that based on how they think about it, because we, we have internal representations of our experience, and you can elicit that from a person. You know, what, how do you imagine this? What, you know, everybody has images of what, what their disease or their condition is. And you can create metaphors and stories around that and help the person to start to manipulate, to gain a sense of control over it. And uh, a little bit later on, we're going to be talking about how they created this imagery that started to affect and eliminate 
cancerous tumors that started to affect and increase the immune response in some of these things. Uh, so in doing, these, in doing this work with the mental imagery, the, the treatment must always be represented as being very strong, very powerful. So if someone's uh, having chemotherapy and you're doing imagery for that, the, the medication, the chemo, all of the things that are being done in that direction, uh, the imagery is always of, of it being very strong, very powerful, uh, very intelligent. And the cancer cells, in, in the case of the Simonton studies, the cancer cells must always be imagined as being very weak, very confused. So you, you, you limit and, and make, those, make the imagery, the thoughts, the impression of the cancer itself as being weak and confused. And this is powerful. And what do we, and I made a note here to myself, what do we do in our society now? What have we done the last few decades about cancer, for instance? We, you know, we've done just the opposite, basically. Fight. It's always about fight this cancer. The, the cancer is seen and, and perceived as being powerful, as having power over your body. And the reason these techniques work is because you flip that over. You switch that. You take away the power of the cancer and you put the power, the power on the cure and the, and the you know, chemo or whatever else is being used. So uh, the normal cells uh, must be seen as strong and smart enough to avoid any uh, drugs or medications that are going into the body, any treatment that's being done. So there are ways uh, that they would do imagery where they would have the mind create, focus on those, those normal cells so, so they got protected and they were shielded from any negative effects. And it, and it just is amazing. The mind gets that. Now, the white blood cells, which are, of course, all important in, in cancer, in working with cancer patients, they must also be perceived as being very intelligent, very strong, and they act like an aggressive army. Some of the imagery uh, from, the, from this book and from some of the other books on uh, using imagery for cancer are about uh, there's, there's an army of cells that go in that are that are the white blood cells, and they're fighting that cancer. They're, they're eliminating it. Uh, it's important to make the white blood cells the most powerful and potent factor in healing. They should be absolutely no doubt that they will prevail. And in the imagination, you can do that. Uh, now, the imagery is, is very important with these kinds of goals with health. And obviously, these are the kind of things that that you can work with in the hypnotic brainwave state. And yet the person, when they're out in the world and they start talking with uh, friends and relatives and doctors again out in the real world, uh, there, there are things that I believe as a, a hypnotherapist, as, as someone who's working with these kinds of conditions and diseases, that you have to also prepare the person on a conscious, logical mind level to be able to start being prepared and, 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 working in new habits of speaking, how they talk about themselves, how they talk about their treatment, how they talk about what they're doing in ways that are also supportive of the imagery that's happening at the uh, higher mind or unconscious level. Um, many years ago, when I first started studying hypnosis, I was out, out in California, and I would make trips uh, oh, two, three times a year to Arizona. There was an organization there at the time that's no longer there, but at the time there was a, a group called the um, National Board for Hip. Uh, let's see, National Board for Hypnotherapy and Hypnotic Anesthesiology. <laughs> they all have long names. But anyway, uh, Dr. Longacre was, uh, was the head of that organization. And uh, a few years after I started going there, he had, he had passed away and the organization went away. But it was an, a remarkable place to be able to go and study. That's where I got some of my first uh, great trainings in the medical side of hypnosis and the anesthesia and the immune system and addictions and some of those things. And Dr. Longacre uh, explains, it, now, it, he had some interesting imagery that he used he, for cancer. And he wrote a book called Complementary Medicine, Self-Help Healing. This, that's the name of his book. He would picture himself, because he did, he did con contract uh, cancer later in his life. He would picture himself 
lying on his side in an open space of bare ground in the desert. It's a warm winter day with perfect temperature and a clear blue sky without any clouds. He would imagine a large popcorn machine like the ones in the movie theaters. And when he turns on the machine, the lid opens and thousands of kernels of popcorn tumble out and into his bloodstream, symbolizing powerful white blood cells that instantly travel through his system to every part of his body. They spread out to the surrounding tissue and smother and then sponge up every cancer cell they come into contact with. The white blood cells then carry the cancer cells to the liver and the bladder, where they are safely discharged from his body. Now, Dr. Longacre would then imagine that whenever a white blood cell would become soiled with the little gray cancer seeds, it leaves the body and is replaced with a hundred, a hundred more new white super blood cells. He would turn on another machine that would spill little red balls into his bloodstream to carry oxygen to all of the healthy cells in his body, ignoring the cancer cells so they would not be nourished. For chemotherapy, he would imagine a glue pot representing the chemo machine that flows glue throughout the bloodstream, coating the cancer cells with the glue and then hardening and drying around, that, around them. This glue would keep the cancer cells from getting any nourishment or oxygen and so they would shrivel up and die and be carried safely out of the system. And again, this is from Dr. Longacre's book uh, that I mentioned earlier, Complementary Medicine, Self-Help Healing. I'm not sure if it's still available in the world. If you'd like to have a copy of this, I give something away every show. You can email me at info at uphypnosis.com or go to my website, www.uphypnosis.com. And you can uh, email me and I will be more than happy to send you uh, this little write-up of the imagery that Dr. Longacre did. If you listen to past shows uh, in the archives and you hear what I'm giving away free, I will still give you whatever I talked about in that show if you email me and, and mention it and say you listen to the show. Some of these shows are good for continuing education for hypnotists. You can contact me about that if you're interested. And we have our hypnosis certification training starting March 8th. You can go to Up Hypnosis and hear about that. And uh, hypnotists, if you're already certified, uh, the price is on there. You can call me or email me, and there's definitely a, a less price. Uh, I've gone to so many certifications in my life, and each one has built on and enhanced the previous ones. I'll I'm a lifetime student. Hopefully you are as well. And even if you aren't in, this, uh, in studying these things to go into practice, of course, I didn't know I was either at the time, but... If you're interested in mind-body medicine and these kinds of things, you can still, we do a lot of classes just for that. The first weekend of our certification is a basic hypnosis training for people. A lot of people come just to that piece to learn hypnosis. And we can give continuing education to nurses now, so you can get uh, credit for coming to that basic hypnosis weekend. Although, usually by the end of the first day, everybody that comes to that weekend decides they want to go through the whole training because there's all those little aha moments and people realize this is just what they had been looking for. And usually when, what do they say, when the student is ready, the teacher seems to somehow magically, wonderfully appear just at the right moment. So I'm getting down to winding down to the rest of the, the end of the show here, reminding you some of these shows are good for continuing education, like I said, and I can let you know how that works. And you can contact me to find out about all the fun things we do at Up Hypnosis Institute in Palm Harbor, Florida. Or you can go to the website again and, and see all of our fun things we do. I do some free seminars. I do a, a free meetup uh, every other month or so. And we do a lot of fun things on self-hypnosis and the master class, of course, where you can be hypnotized. And it's continuing education for hypnotists. So I want to thank you for tuning in to Think Up Unlimited Possibilities. This is TalkWad.com, TalkWad Network. And I am Patricia V. Scott. So remember to think up and expect unlimited possibilities.